Okay, so today on the Live On Form podcast, we are joined by Mr. Bobby Rich. Bobby, how are you? Very good, sir. How are you? Splendid. All good. Thank you for having me on. Hey, thanks for thanks for taking the time because I know you're a very busy man. Uh, I, I, I thought about how do I introduce you, and there's there's multiple ways, <laughs> multiple avenues, and and I'm I'm actually going to go by your LinkedIn. So at present, you're a senior talent manager for the Sanity Group. I am indeed. Uh, you've been in the press of late as the man responsible for keeping David Beckham in shape. I'm indeed. sure that there's an expansion to that story. I'm sure that we can get into, and. Uh, Obviously, your martial arts background, in many respects, the, uh, the there's an awful lot I know out there about your background with judo and jujitsu. Now, latterly, kind of CrossFit. Uh, I know you're doing a lot of that stuff, but you're a guy who's always kept himself in shape. Performance has been a massive narrative over the, your life. So, I think, I think probably the best thing we can do is maybe start at the at the beginning, which is how I always like to start with people. Is just tell me a bit about your history. Uh, performance. Uh, I know sports played a massive role in your life, and and where things have gone from then. And then we'll get into the the later years where things have evolved, and you, and you create this really interesting story, really. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know better than a lot of people out there. I mean, you and I have known each other. What when was Third Space was? I mean, I joined Third Space two thousand and one. I think it was just six months after it opened, and you joined when? Uh, I can't recall. It was, it was it was a while ago. <laughs> it was a while back. Yeah, it's it's what will it be? 15, 15, 20 years almost, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, fitness was. I mean, fitness was the largest part of my largest part of my life. I mean, me mum, she uh, got me stuck into judo when I was six years old. You know, grew up in grew up in Dalston in Hackney before it was cool. Um, you know, I think there was I was quite a rough kid. You know, not rough in terms of up to no good on the streets or anything, but, you know, I'd hang out with friends and I would always want to wrestle and have a laugh and a joke. And um, I think combination between that and also growing up in Hackney where it's a little bit rough, you know, she wanted to keep me safe. So she took me to a, a club when I was six years old. And uh, that was it. That was the beginning of judo. I mean, and for ultimately the following 22 years of my professional career within judo. I mean... You know, I'm forever grateful to my mum introducing me to the sport. Why judo? Because, because obviously judo, I guess, I guess it depends where you where you're brought up. I mean, is there a judo club local to you? I think he's always going to be a. a yeah, you know, I want to give you a. I want to give you a, a bigger story that you know there was my mum was whatever or my dad was whatever, but I think at the time it was just logistics. You know, there was a judo club round the corner that my mum could drop me off um, and then go and do her work or errands whatever she was doing and come back however that didn't really work out she got into it as much as I did bless her she would come and sit and watch every single training session she then proceeded to travel around the country as my career got a little bit bigger and brighter and she would sit you know she sat in every single leisure center or arena or stadium and watched me fight around the world bless her but uh yeah that was it it was yeah started out as logistical I think which I guess is is the case in, in you know track and field anything like that you've got to have facilities somewhere near you right in order to to, to do it it's yeah. uh, so it, it's interesting because you refer to it as as your career and I think I think so many you know kids maybe not at six years old but certainly kids they aspire to have a career in sport which is clearly what what you've managed to do and yeah. obviously along the way you've 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 notched up some quite significant mantles in the world of judo so so you started when you were six when did you start you know when was it forged into a career when were you starting to i mean listen six like anything that you do at that age it was just more you know getting rid of excess energy and just hanging out with some friends and just enjoying it it wasn't for another you know at that point I was going like once or twice a week and enjoying it it wasn't until I got to about I think probably around the age of 13 you know I'm not the tallest of chaps but I was certainly stockier and a bit thicker than most of the other sort of 13 14 year olds um you know that's when you know things start changing in your body and you know, start getting a bit stronger. And it was then that I started reckoning, oh, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at this. And I was going to little local tournaments or gradings at the time. Um, 
And, you know, I was turning people over that were my weight. Obviously, judo is done in weight categories. Um, and then in certain tournaments when you're younger, there's sort of age brackets. But, you know, if even when I was sitting at the bottom of the age bracket, I was, I was competing against older kids that were two or three years older and two or three years older. And, but, you know, when you're 13 or 14 and then you're fighting a 16 or 17 year old, you know, young man, that's quite a lot. So it was around that time that I realized, oh, I'm okay at this. And then I think I won my, I got my black belt when I was 16. Um, and then my and first- just, And just for context with, with that, a, a black belt in judo is where, because obviously people always assume black belt, they always base belt on karate, right? I think people always- <laughs> Yeah, do that. no, that's a so, good point. That's a so good where point. is a black belt in judo? What's that regarded as? So black belt, I mean, you get to the black belt, which, you know, in most sports, that's the pinnacle of the, you know, pinnacle, the, the top grade that you can get in the sport. Um, but you can only get that when you're 16. You know, it's not like karate and absolutely no disrespect. Listen, I know some karate guys and it's, you know, there's so many disciplines of karate, but, you know, I, I there's kids that you see like seven or eight years old and they've got a black belt. <laughs> you're like, oh, you know, I don't know quite how that works. Um, and I'll get on to jiu-jitsu in a minute because that's a, that's a much better... Yeah, that's all different think, grading. It's, grading system. Yeah. it's a totally different um, methodology. But, um, yeah, it's you can get your black belt and then you move onwards and upwards to first down, second down, seventh down, uh, third. I think the, the highest is is seventh, I think, I believe. You know, been out of it, the inner circle for some time now, but I think the highest is seventh down. Um but yeah, you get that when you're 16. I got that when I was 16. Um, you have to do a lineup. Um, you have to win three fights during the morning and then you do three more fights, but they're back to back. And these, there's no age limit. So when you go for your black belt, you know, I was 16 years old and I remember the lineup. They were just some of the biggest, ugliest, hairiest men, you know, and there's little old me at 16 years old. But, uh, you know, did that and um, yeah, got my black belt. And then that was the same year that I got onto the British team for the first time and won my first British title. And then that was it really. So it was around about 14, 15, that was my, you know, oh, I'm good at something. I'm gonna get my teeth stuck into something. And ultimately that was then sort of molded what I then wanted to do as a, because I say career in judo, but there's no money in judo, you know, yeah, yeah. back then, you know, there was no, what did we have? We had MySpace back then, you know, <laughs> so, you know, there was certainly no, that was the, I'm sure was, ready to listen to the MySpace. MySpace. what is he on about? Yeah. Right so there was no, uh, you know, there was no brand partnership opportunities with Instagram and stuff like that. You know, the, the association were great. They, they sorted out judo kits and travel and hotels and expenses were paid for, but there was no, there, that was it there was a, you know a, a pat on the back and a medal to go with it yeah but uh you know i then i got into coaching you know much like yourself i got into personal training you know when i was i went to college studied sports science and then during that time you know i was still too young when i was at college i was working on reception at it was a martial arts um gym called the academy in um in hobson square a, by Bob Breen, renowned Jeet Kune Do Academy, phenomenal place. And um, yeah, I was, re I was a receptionist there when I was studying and then passed my qualifications. And yeah, at 18, I was, you know, I was a personal trainer back then, you know, which I think at the time and for many years after that, it was the perfect job. You know, it allowed me the, the flexibility. I lived and breathed in a gym, you know, trained people you know, took an hour off, I'd go and hit the gym myself. And, you know, so it was perfect. So, and then that led me a couple of years there. And then that led me on to the third space where you and I met. And then from personal, so from personal training, obviously things have moved in multiples of directions. You've always kept that overlying thing of training people. Uh, I believe throughout, for, throughout, you know, your time with, with various people and doing various things. And there's always been that I continue to train people whilst doing other things for them and, and, and servicing, servicing them in other ways. So after personal training at, at third space, obviously we met at third space, you know, at the time you were, 
you were training pretty hard. Uh, you know, you, I think there's like British championships you'd been doing in 2001 to 2007. I think you know, so you're being very kind, mate. Sorry to interrupt. You're saying train pretty hard, but you were the one that was coaching me in my strength <laughs> and conditioning, making me do all that hard work. So, yeah. well, you know, like anybody, hard. you know, a coach needs a coach, right? So exactly. I was, I was, I was thankfully given that, that, that opportunity to, to, to do that. And yeah, we, we, you know, and I think we actually, well, we trained together a lot of the time because yeah. I think our goals were very, very similar and obviously strength levels and blah, 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 were very similar as well. So I think it was, you know, and, and, and it, it was an interesting time. And, and obviously you, you had the ultimate goal there of, of, of hitting the Olympics. Uh, I think between, it was 2001 to 2007, if my research serves me correctly, you won seven consecutive medals at the, was it the British Championships? Yeah, British titles, seven consecutive. So there was a number of them were, um, I can't even remember. You've got this, you've done the stats. I can't even remember. I think, I think there were seven consecutive medals. I think five of them were consecutive gold and then a couple silver and, and bronze here and there. But it was certainly around that time. Which in any sport is phenomenal, right? Which in any sport is phenomenal, whether you you know whatever it might be. You've gone to the British Championships. You're you're, you're the best in Britain, right? For your weight class and your category or whatever it might be. So you've notched these up, and then obviously at the time when we were working together, the the, the goal was to to hit the Olympics, right? In two thousand and what year? Two thousand eight. Two thousand eight, right? That was the that was the um, that was the sweet spot. That was the prime one. You know, I think I was sort of knocking around. You know, and I had a lot of friends that went to two thousand and four. You know, I had no chance. I was, you know, aspirations to get there, but, you know, sort of very naive aspirations to get to 2004. But yeah, 2008 was the, could have been my time, you know, just missed out, but. And, and very narrowly missed out, right? It was, you know, it was real touch and go. I think there was, there was, a, there was a couple of guys or something sort of snuck in and. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was, it was, I mean, I would never change anything, you know, but um, the... I figured, one, I figured that now, I think, you know, obviously things push you in different directions, but we'll get on to that shortly. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the guy that ended up going before, a chap called Winston Gordon, phenomenal judoka, you know, and he had actually been to a, the previous Olympics of 2004. Um, and, you know, we weren't only teammates in GB, so we wouldn't only just meet every six weeks at squad training in Sheffield or Bisham Abbey and you know have huge dust-ups you know which was like most of the other people in weight categories fighting against their um competition in britain you know we were also club mates so we would go to the buddha quite which i think you came down a couple of times did, yeah yep yeah, yeah. quite down on fulham road you know that was at the time that was you know it's things have changed now they have a head of um center of excellence up in warsaw but that was the center of excellence at the time and it was just Tuesday, Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday was just all out war, you know. And um, me and Winston, you know, we were having all out wars every Monday night, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we knew each other inside out, inside out, you know. It was for us, I think, when we used to fight each other, we used to think this was the most exciting, explosive thing to watch. I remember fighting, you know, re watching a fight that we had in the British Open, which, you know, I just beat him and this was a year and a half before the Olympics. Um, and in my mind, I remember this fight. I was like, that was some fight. The people must have been on the edge of their seat. But in reality, I watched the playback and I was like, it was like a game of chess. It was just like, you know, it was, it was so technical. We knew each other inside out. Um, but it was, yeah, it was one and two right through the, the Olympic qualification process and you know he went to the europeans and did well and then ultimately he went but you know is what it is like i said wouldn't change anything and i think i think just based on what you were saying now i think i think judo is one of those sports and you know i've i've spent a lot of time around different sports over the over the years and judo is most definitely one of those sports where when you watch it on tv or when you see it played back or when you ever see it like that it isn't it doesn't do it. It's full justice. And I've never seen any time I've ever seen it, it, it live and ever, t you know, like a lot of sports, you know, you see it live and you're like, wow, that's, that's incredible. It's like, you know, I, I played a lot of cricket and I always remember cricket watching cricket live for the first time and watching a high level of cricket live for the first time. And, and when you, you can't actually see the ball, yeah, 
it's moving that fast. But then when you see it on on TV, it all seems quite slow and quite monotonous. And I, and I think judo is one of them sports that it just doesn't do it justice. I mean, the power and the yeah. force that's generated in in watching you guys even just just spar, you know, was phenomenal. Which which I think is the same with you know uh, BJJ, which we'll obviously get get into shortly. But yeah, yeah. it was. I mean, you know, you know they. From my time when I was competing, and what you just said there, it, it's totally true. Um, they changed it a lot now to make it viewer friendly, so to speak. You know, it has had a bit of an impact on on what happens in sport. Some good, there's some bigger throws, and it's a bit more exciting. But there's other rules which, you know, I mean, I was a, I was much more of a, you know, my conditioning was a big thing. My, you know just headstrong i'll be in your face until the very last second attitude was a big thing i wasn't technically brilliant and beautiful um as a judo player but you know i had some heart but and with that it was more of a wrestling style so for me it was a lot about you know close contact like you know gripping here grabbing legs and it you know you do think like if someone's watching this or someone's looking at this, I should say, because, you know, it's not a sport that you can just look at and understand. Like boxing, if you're watching TV, right, and you're switching through the channels. Yeah, yeah. If you look at you, you look at boxing, you can see within 10 seconds who's being the more dominant fighter. You know, it's quite clear, usually, who's, who's doing the damage, who's getting the damage. But within judo, you actually have to watch it and you have to have some sort of understanding of what's going on. Otherwise, it just looks like two guys in a pair of pyjamas you know, just hugging it out, you know. So, yeah, it's changed a lot since then, but it's, yeah, it's, it's fair, to, fair to agree with your comment. I think that's, a, it's like MMA, right? It's like when it goes to ground in MMA, you know, to... You remember back in the day when things used to go to the ground in MMA, yeah. people used to boot. They just didn't understand what was going on. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll get on to, you know, we'll, we'll chat about Roger at some point, but, but again, you know, groundwork was, you know, it was like you had no idea who was winning. Yeah. If you didn't understand the sport itself, you just mm. see... And then all of a sudden, somebody's tapping on the floor, and you'd be like, "Oh, something happened there," and and somebody's done something which requires, yeah, somebody required huge technical skill and ability and all these different things. Then it's just over. And I think yeah. Juno is very much like that. And, and and obviously, so from there, you've, you know, you missed out on the Olympics, and then and then kind of things took a turn, didn't they? So you so you had some opportunities. And I always say with, with opportunity, opportunities arise because you, you put yourself out there and you, you know, you do these different things and then, and then your career kind of took a, a, a bit of a diversion at that point, didn't it? Yeah, it did a bit really. And listen, it kind of started, you know, a couple of years before I actually hung my judo kit up. Um, you know, who knows whether it was my decisions then to work, so to speak, full time, but it was flexible. Um, had an impact on what I'm doing. I'm sure it did. But, you know, like I said, there was, there was no money in judo. You know, family lived abroad. I was here, I had bills to pay. And, you know, it was, it was a decision that I took very seriously. Um, but again, not something that I ever regret. You know, it was my first job away from a gym or from, you know, coaching on the judo mat was, you know, working with, as you know, Guy Ritchie for several years, you know, so, several years you know, full time um, guy, you know, the Budokai Judo Club has the judo was upstairs and then downstairs was karate sessions and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Now guy, he's, he's a phenomenal athlete himself. He, um, he did karate downstairs. He was a black belt in karate, but then after, you know, some knee problems, he had some operations and, you know, he decided to take up Jiu Jitsu. Um, which now, you know, 15 years later, he's also a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Um, but he, the jiu-jitsu boys used to come upstairs. So the groundwork in jiu-jitsu and the groundwork yeah. in judo is very, very similar. Um, so, you know, they were, their training sessions used to be at a, a half an hour, start half an hour before us and they'd finish half an hour earlier. And then they would come upstairs and want to join in on the, the groundwork, um, groundwork with the judo lads. And, um, you know, this is around the time, you know, Guy, I mean, Guy at that point, he'd been there for some time before I met him and he had shot a lot of stock. Um, he had done snatch um, and he had used several of the chaps from the Budokai. You know, they've all got, you know, broken <laughs> noses or cauliflower ears. Like they've just come straight out of my Richie film. So, 
you know, he, I met him there, um, a mutual friend of ours, who was also my coach, Ray Stevens, Olympic silver yeah. medalist. Um, he, Guy approached him and said, my assistant has just become producer. Um, do you know anyone who would like to do some running, you know, assist the director, do some running um, and assist me with my career and personal life and yeah and bear training I think there was probably an element of some security in there which then <laughs> throughout my career kind of you know helped the clients I worked with um yeah Ray introduced me Guy and I and um I ticked all those boxes and yeah that started you know I was working in for about a year as a runner um you know at this point I was 20 I think actually it was a few more years before the Olympics I was 24 when I met Guy yeah. Um, but Guy was awesome. He was super, he knew what my goal was, you know, in terms of what I was trying to do in judo and his passion for martial arts himself. He took great pride in having someone that worked for him was, you know, yeah. at a certain level. And um, ultimately he got free jiu-jitsu and judo lessons, you know, on a daily basis as well. Um, so it worked out nicely. But yeah, that was around about 24 years old and I was his runner for a year. And then was then went on to be his personal assistant executive assistant for five six years after you know which for me uh, I, I knew nothing about this world knew nothing about celebrity um and what came with it you know I was a 24 year old kid that just wants to fight <laughs> you know so yeah really interesting I in a controlled yeah. manner what's that fight in a controlled manner in a controlled manner, not, a control manner, manner. Yeah. not after the, the, the last orders in a kebab. Yeah, shop. we were just talking about lock stock, so I just want to <laughs> yeah. clear that up. Yeah. So from there, so you, you work for Guy and obviously I would imagine some really interesting times, right? So on set, uh, yeah. films and, you know, meeting lots of people and, and, and were the people there where, you know, were you into that world? Were you into movies? Were you into that sort of thing? I mean, at the time I wasn't really into... I mean, I say into, you know, I love movies, love music, love a number of things, but, you know, I hadn't really exposed myself to anything to other than judo, you know, so it was a completely new world and a world that I got into for, for the right reasons, you know, um, I ended up working on several of Guy's films, you know, we did Rock and Roller, we did Sherlock Holmes 1 and 2, in between those we did a number of commercials that guy did you know so it was a real unique situation you know a number of people that I met during that time and to this day you know are great friends of mine um but yeah I mean bizarre bizarre world from like a sweaty judo mat to all of a sudden I mean you and I I sent you a picture the other day of you know we were maybe it must have been 10 12 years ago we were yeah. going to the UFC you know and I remember that was my birthday and, you know, we had Guy and several of the cast members of Sherlock with, on the River Thames going to going to the UFC to watch a fight. You know, it's, you sort of look back and you're like, bizarre time, but yeah. Yeah, a little surreal somewhat. Yeah, 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 truly surreal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, you know, it was, I don't know, it wasn't something that I thought about doing, but, you know, you fell, in, there, you fell I, into it, right? fell into it but you know from there you know I ended up working out in the states for a short period of time with Jason Statham um in the same capacity but also trained him as well so and was that did you meet him through the movies or was that sporting because I, I know that Jason was Jason would have been was he not trying for the Olympics probably similar year yeah no he was he was way before so Jace was Commonwealth champion in diving in 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 highboard diving, excuse yeah. my terminology, whoever sees this and came to me for it. But yeah, whatever, it was like highboard, is it t the 10 meter board? Or something? Yeah, something like, uh, I know it was diving, but it was, you know, and, and apparently very good, right? Very, very good. Like Jace himself, and not enough people know this, and uh, you know, you see him in his films and he's fighting and yeah, yeah. choreography, which by the way, so working with Jace was just a, a another, phenomenal experience because Jason you know we were going down to when really he's preparing for films you know Jason obviously knows my background you know he had me involved coming down to work with you know some of the stunt team you yeah. know so we were down there's a wonderful place called 8711 down in LA near, near LAX and um 
you know, he would have me on the mat or on the springboard working with some of the best stuntmen in not just the States, but in the industry, you know, um, doing amazing things. And that was funny because, you know, I think I know how to fight. You know, so I'm going in there. I'm like, that would never work. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And they're all like, that's awesome, but it looks dog shit on camera. <laughs> you know, so it was all about like angles and you know yeah, yeah, yeah. that. That again was something. Else. So I was, I was with him for some time, but yeah, we used to. I used to train him, get him ready for films. And it's like I heard you talking the other day um, to someone, and you were just talking about you know how hard it was when you actually stepped away from coaching because you loved you loved coaching yeah yeah you know, so despite i you know moved away from working in gyms and being a coach you know i was so happy that the people that i was working with they were all active in you know guy with jujitsu loved going to the gym jason the gym but then also with his stunt stuff you know, I continued coaching them. It was just something that I loved. And then ultimately I came back from working with Jason and I, and then I ended up landing the job with our mate, with David Hay as his strength and conditioning coach for um, that crazy fight in Upton Park against Derek Chisora. So, you know, that was, that was his S&C coach for six months, you know, which was, again, mind-blowing, you know, and you nothing about boxing itself apart from what i like to watch but yeah. you know you know what it is it's you know you you recognize and understand the movement you understand the body and then you tailor what we know um around what he needs and you know but that was yeah the boxing industry wow whole different ballpark huh yeah whole different ballpark but again phenomenal so you know i kind of did that stint working with these guys and then it's funny how i then came back to coaching you know it was something I truly love. And, and so how did the thing with David Pan out? How, how did that happen? That was just, you were just done with the, the stuff with Jason and, and that yes. kind of came to an end because he was, I guess, so the project and I guess moving around and doing bits exactly and pieces. That. We were I was out there for two films. We did a, two productions um, and then that was all the contracted to do. I had other matters back home and then came home Um you know, third space, what a, what a place. Because obviously I've met David back when he was 20 yeah, yeah, yeah. at the third space, you know, him and Adam Booth, they were doing this stuff for, I think, you know, he was coaching there as an amateur when, you know, he got his first contract yep. through. Um, you know, and I've known those guys since then, you know, until 2001. So they were working with someone else at a time and I think they just wanted to change it up a little bit. And I came back and... I think it was, again, I ticked a number of boxes of, I was able to manage, you know, stuff that I had ended up doing, you know, with Guy and Jason, with press, you know, media opportunities, managing sort of brands and yep. partnerships that I could bring in. But by the way, I can also be his SNC coach um, and advise on a number of other things. So, yeah. I, I think you were just about to say there, and it is kind of close protection, but then you, you were like, well, it's David here. Maybe people won't believe me on that one. <laughs> well, you say that. I mean, you know, David, I think everyone, you know, who follows David, they remember that brawl that he had in Germany with Derek Chisora. I think my this title that used to come up, so I was never a security guard. I was never a bodyguard. Um, but, you know, again, my cauliflower ears and my thick neck and you know I, you know even guy guy was hanging around on set for a period of time and you hang around a set guy sticks you in front of you he's like go and stick this suit and i want you to look like a russian security guard in rock and roller yeah 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 so like you know I, okay i i am what i look I, I, i'll do it i am that stereotype <laughs> yeah so you know david you know that altercation happened in germany one night we were in, in uh for the god who was fighting it was chisora versus uh klitschko and um, we just popped into the press conference because the next fight David was due to have was with Klitschko. Um, that's why I was brought on to, you know, to get him in shape for the Klitschko fight. And then we were standing at the back of the press conference. No one knew we were there. We just snuck in, had a little look. It was about Chisora. Chisora put on a phenomenal performance that night. And Klitschko's managers just turned around and went, you know, he had, someone had asked him, so when's the David Hay fight? And, um, his manager said, it's never going to happen. 
I'm like, for fuck's sake, like that's just six months of work I've just lost out with because I'm only here to get in shape for that fight. Yeah. You know, David then very vocally shouts out from the back, what do you mean? It's never going to happen. We've got two points on the contract or something like that. You know, the world's press just spin round. No. <laughs> like that. I'm standing, I'm standing next to David. I'm like that, you know, trying to move out. <laughs> Shuffling up. And, you know, then this whole thing happens between Derek and David of, you know, this is Derek's limelight. You know, he's just put on a performance of his life against Klitschko, wins world rounds. You know, it's his moment. And David's now, no one cares about him. They're all on David. So they then start whatever. Derek Chisora gets up, starts walking towards David. And I'm next to him, you know. David's got a bottle in his hand that he's drinking some apple juice. And I'm just, I'm like, you see my hand in the picture trying to take this bottle away. And before you know it, I'm in the middle of these two huge dudes who, you know, elite quite athletes. Quite hard. What's that? Who hit quite hard. Yeah. I mean, it was just, I was yeah. stuck in the middle and I'm like, you know, I will happily wrestle you two, but I'm not getting into a punching match with either of you, you know? So that all kicked off. And I think, you know, there's a few pictures knocking around where I'm, you know, the whole man handling to Zora. I think, I think, I think obviously I, I recall a couple of them, I think. Uh, you know, and I think after that, I think, you know, any position that I then got with my clients for working with families or training or within branding or whatever I did, they were like, oh, you know, our clients also save for Bobby. We don't need security either. It's like a you know, <laughs> save of a cost there. So that was that was kind of that. But, you know, yeah. So so after David, then it was that was then it was kind of another David to some degree. But it was uh, it actually it, it wasn't David, was it? It was no. I mean, I, God, I just went on. I went on tour for a little while. So I did a little stint in music. Um, but this sounds so preposterous. I, I rarely I do these podcast or, or talk about anything um sounds surreal just talk about but yeah i went on tour with madonna obviously madonna and guy were married when i was working with guy um and i went on tour worked with the production team there um and and helped her helped her team out there and that was a, a world tour we did six months um you know i'm very close with guy and madonna's son rocco um to this day and um, spent a lot of time looking after him, you know, training the team on the tour. And um, yeah, so that was that was another. Please tell me it was the dance team. It was not the dance team. All oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I had visions of you there doing some uh, some Madonna moves, just uh, doing doing a bit of dance in there. Bit like some things no one wants to see. <laughs> won't do. <laughs> no, some things people don't need to see. But yeah, so that was that. And um, yeah, then, then came back. Um, yeah, and then that was the other David. I eventually worked, you know, David Beckham's a sincere friend of mine um, and the family. And um, I ended up working with those guys for a number of years um, with the family, but more so with Brooklyn. Um, you know, we spent a stint, stint of time out in New York um, where, we did that in New York, New Brooklyn was studying. Um, so we were out there for a bit and that led to sort of where I, where I am now. You know, I really got the taste of over the years of these situations that I've been in with individuals, but also individuals in a number of different industries. I've built up this, you, you know, I, mean, I, I, I will talk to anyone and I love to talk and I love to network and, you know, but it's never small talk. You know, I love to find out what I'm so nosy I'm, that's the <laughs> way to put it it's super nosy um intrigued um, with everything and I've amassed this kind of network of brands and contacts um and then a short while ago I left I left working with the Beckhams and decided to set up my own consultancy um as a brand partnerships manager um and then worked at Sony Music for two years in the brand partnership division, worked across the global roster there. Um, and that's acting kind of as a middleman between brands and the artists to bring yep. deals together, whatever those deals might be, whether it's a simple social activation or above the line um, deal on, on TV. Um, and um, but I was a middleman, you know, so they had their management and you're kind of floating in between the management and the clients. So earlier last year just around the time covid had 
kicked off. I had taken on a couple of athletes, a couple of CrossFit athletes, Megan Lovegrove, Elliot Simmons, um, and then Coach Gus from over at WIP. Yep. And um, decided I just wanted to manage people, solely wanted to manage people. Um, and it was funny because, you know, spending all this time in music or the film industry and doing whatever else I did that I absolutely loved. Um, and it got me to where I am today. But, you know, I did that full circle back into fitness, you know, now working with these CrossFit athletes. And it's amazing. You know, I'm sitting in these meetings and stuff and I, I know what I'm talking about. You know, it's, a, it's, it's something that I've lived and breathed for 25 years, you know. So all that managing people personally um, and all those contacts now bringing that all into focus and became a talent manager um, taking on a few more and then I've just joined forces with Insanity Group under Andy Varley which is you know I must say is the the nicest man the biggest gent in the industry and it's an absolute pleasure to join forces with those guys um, so yeah I mean <laughs> in short that's <laughs> that's what I've been up to in short, yeah, and like I said at the start, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it is a fascinating story. It's a, it's a, it's a journey where I think there's a lot of people will look at and go, wow, you know, there's some, you know, and obviously there's the rubbing shoulders aspect of it, but then there's also that overlying thing of, as you're going along, you're learning a lot of things here. You learn a lot of life skills. You learn a lot of things. And what I was going to point out when you said about David going back into David's camp, right? You've known him for a long time. You said there were certain things that sort of appealed to him, and one of the things I was actually going to say whilst you were talking was the communication aspect, right? Is that, is that one of the overlying factors here with all of this, you know, at, at any stage where if you're going to be dealing with anybody of, 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 of that kind of, uh, how would you say, sort of exposure to the world, right? You know, your communication skills have got to be on point. You've got to be able to talk to these people. You've also got to be able to be, uh, you know, calm and collected and, and that level of humility, right? And this has always been, you know, quite an interesting thing because, you know, throughout my years, I've, I've dealt with, with client, well-known clients, right? You, you deal with these people who are well-known and, and have been in the media and you've seen them and you kind of know them before you know them and you've never met them before. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you've got you've to almost treat them like just normal people, which is what they are, right? And this is this. Hi, this. Sir, I'm Bobby. What's your name? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, I know who you are. Yeah. Yeah. and this is this fascinating thing. You know, I remember, I remember bumping into a friend of mine, Simon. I think you probably know Simon. In, uh, we were in New York and we were in this gym and I was training with, with again, a, a mutual friend of ours, Andrew. And, and I said, the guy over there looks, he looks properly like my mate, Simon. He goes, that's funny. He goes, the guy with him looks properly like Daniel Craig. And my mate, Simon, <laughs> trained, and my mate, Simon trains Daniel Craig. So I've gone over and said, Hey, mate. He goes, oh, my God, you know, what are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. So he shook his hand, and obviously Dan's came over and gone, uh, my name's Daniel Craig. And I'm like, how do I respond to that? Do I go, I know. And, and <laughs> you know, it's like when you, you know, you know someone, but you've never met them before. It's a bit like the social media dilemma, right? Yeah. Now. So, yeah. You, know, you know, I'll bump into people at conventions that come over, and they, they, they kind of say, hey, Phil, and I have no idea who they are. Yeah. But it's kind of that, that, that extreme of that, right? So yeah. where you're dealing with these people where, it, it almost becomes an overwhelming situation for a lot of people who would be, you know, fanboying, fangirling out about these people. And I think it requires a certain level of decorum, a certain level of, you know, humility from you to be able to do that. So was that something that you you, you kind of struggled with initially? Because obviously when you, when you met Guy, did you know a lot about him or not? I mean, what's a lot, right? Knowing a lot now. So you mentioned Instagram now. Yeah. I mean, how much do we think we know about someone through that? I mean, at the time, I mean, mentioned MySpace, you know, I didn't even use it that much, but there was no access. So I knew what probably, you know, most people knew, you know, when he released a film or he'd been on TV or there was a newspaper article or something like that back in the day. But in actual fact, that might actually have the reverse opinion from what you might think, because you know, a celebrity back then was what I think was way more of a thing back then, right? There was this mystique. Yeah, yeah, massively, of, right? You know, so... And at know. the time, was he He was was he married to Madonna at the time? Yeah, yeah. So obviously, yeah. That, that, everybody knew at that point, you know, she, she was probably one of the big celebrities at that point. In oh, time, right? huge. I mean, listen, like, I... Everybody knew her. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, you know, 
turning up first day at work and you know there was paparazzi and stuff just outside the door and you know that to me was you know I, I knew where I was going knew who I was about to start work with you know ultimately it wasn't just guys and um, but it was you know it was um it didn't prepare me for <laughs> things like so tell me about so tell me about that so you've you've just walled up I'm assuming at the house right yes. so you you've turned up for work at the house uh you know in wherever and you've rolled up to the door this the paparazzi at the door right is this almost like a permanent fixture yeah i mean back then again it's that same same thing you know it's, so they're waiting for somebody to leave the house so they can get a exactly. shot you know, away yeah. you go right yeah. well, slightly different to probably how it works nowadays right yeah. so you've rolled up to the house are you what have you got like a gym bag over your shoulder and things like this i'm just kind of probably yeah for sure you so know you've up, probably you come straight from the gym and i'm yeah a sweaty mess and, and what, you just gone you just went and knocked on the door yeah yeah and, and that was it you just went and knocked on the door there's all these people taking pictures going who's this guy they're like who's this guy and i'm like <laughs> i'm in i'm on the other side being like what on earth have i <laughs> right i don't you know it's a completely new world to me but you you, you know you get used to it and i there is every all the aspects that you were talking about about decorum and, and humility, you know. But I, I think a lot of that came from sport and judo and, and how I conducted myself with in those instances, you know, that was stuff that had been ingrained in me from, you know, despite although I got better at judo when I was 15 or 16 from six years old when my mum turned up, you know, just you know, from putting your gi on in a certain way and tying your belt in a certain way and having the respect for the mat and your opponents and, you know, losing, you know, when you think you should have won. And, you know, it, that, that's a huge learning lesson. And I think all of that played a huge role into, you know, who I am today, how I deal with situations, whether it be with press or celebrity. But I do think, you know, a lot of the guys that I ultimately ended up, you know, ultimately worked with, you know, I met Guy on a map, you know, I think I met Jason on the map. Um, and then I met David and a number of other people, you know, Hay in the gym. Yep. Bex, I think through, through Guy at some time. And, you know, it, when I met Guy, I think the first time I was trying to do, I was trying to choke him out was the first time I met him, right? You know, we were on the judo mat. So I think certain barriers, <laughs> you know, yeah, they're, they're kind of you guys too, or you don't care whether they're famous or if they're the richest man in the world or if they're whatever. Yeah. It's like each man to their, every man for themselves, you know. It's so you know, it's probably the the situations I met them as well. Yeah, no, it's it, it, it's fascinating, and it, it really is, especially that carryover where you talked about sort of martial arts and you know what carried over from judo there with with the discipline, with all of those different aspects. So let's talk about that. So. Throughout life, you've learned these these lessons, right, from sport. So in your case, it was judo, and it was this that you know you tie your belt a certain way. You, you know you you're very respectful to the area and the people that surround you, right? You know the, you, you know you bow and you you know there's certain things you do and there's certain things you don't. So there's this overlying rules to everything, right? And then you've also got the discipline and the being able to almost control yourself, right? Because you know something like judo, and I know how you fight, right? And, and, you know, when, when somebody's in your face, like you, you do, and, and, you know, very, very tight to you and not letting you go and blah, blah, blah. It's the sort of thing that, you know, in a schoolyard, people get irritated about, and it would be the sort of thing that people would fall. Oh, it's horrible. It's, it's yeah, horrible. <laughs> it's grim, right? Yeah, but, yeah. But ultimately you've got to do that with that level of respect where the other person has got to accept that that's what you've got into. And this is this this has always been the fascinating thing to me, especially with things like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and blah blah blah. Where there's this thing where you're almost at each other's throats, and you're doing this thing which is almost quite it is quite violent, but it also isn't. Yeah, and it's this reserved control of of and and we, I've talked about martial arts with other people where you know you carry that over into the way you compose yourself in life, right? Is that do you think you look at situations differently? Do you think your mindset's different? Do you think all of that's been built from that foundation of martial arts? Or do you think, you know, obviously you've got your parents in there as well, they're contributing, doing their bits and pieces. You've got where you grew up. You said you grew up in Hackney, you know, and obviously there was there was there was things going on in Hackney at that particular time that probably opened your eyes to a lot of things. And 
So where do you think all of that stemmed from? Do you think there's certain lessons that you've learned from certain things and then that's just carried over? Or do you think you've continuously carried on learning lessons after that when you've got into these circles of dealing with paparazzi? I mean, firstly, I think what you just said, the latter about continue learning, I mean, that's one of my biggest, I think that's probably one of the biggest things I will tell anyone is that you're always learning. You know, the minute you stop, I mean, we all know this, like just keep your open mind and always learning. I mean, I think everything that you said in terms of, you know, my mum, huge, huge part of my life, you know, and she shaped, ultimately shaped who I am now, you know. Um, but every aspect that you mentioned there is, of course, they all, they all play a part, you know, where I grew up, who I hang around with, you're, a, you know, you're, you are who you are and who you hang out with and where you hang out. Um, but I mean, I think judo, it's fair to say, uh, you know, the amount of time that I, I put in, the hours, the hundreds and thousands of hours that I put in on the mat, not even just on the mat, but off the mat, you know, you know, when I was coming off the mat, whether it's from training or whether it was a competition, the hours that I would then spend in my mind replaying a win, you know, not just a loss, but, you know, replaying a win, what could I have done? Why did I do that? How did I do it? Um, you know, I think judo, it's safe to say that judo probably played the biggest, the biggest part in my life. And yeah, it does, you know, I think the biggest thing that you, that you do, you kind of respect the journey, right? I think yeah. that's the biggest thing that you have to respect is the journey and what it took to get from here to here and what went on during that time, not just the success, you know, I, I missed out on the success that I, that I wanted to, you know, my goal was to get to the Olympic Games, you know, I was devastated at the time when I missed out for sure. But, you know, I how, said, do you look, how do you look back at that? Is that something where you feel, is there a deep regret there or is there just a, is it something where you've now reserved to the, the fact that, look, it was, it, there was a myriad of circumstances at the time that didn't kind of align. Uh, you know, there was somebody else there that, that ultimately, if it wasn't you, it was somebody else. You know, how do you look back at that now? Pretty fond memories, to be honest. I don't have well, any, there isn't any know, resentment or any. No, no resentment. I mean, listen, I, I think you'll remember this, but the time I um, I retired, you know, I chose to retire in, I think it was early, the beginning of 2008, you know, and with your help, I was the fittest that I had ever been, you know the strongest I've ever been. And I felt absolutely bulletproof, you know, and I just missed out. And that was kind of it. I kind of knew that that was it. I think, you know, after I retired and then I took a year out, had a knee up and then, um, you know, Olympics 2012 was on the back door. It was in East London, right? Just around the corner from Grub. Yeah. So I was like, oh, you know, I might just take over and see how I get on. And, you know, I got to the Olympic test event, you know, didn't do too well, um, still had problems with my knee. Um, but, you know, I, I'd give it a go, but I pretty much retired in 2008. But early 2008, that to, back to what I was saying, I was about as fit as I'd ever been, you know? And there was a bit of frustration in me for sure. And that's what led me to go and do the MMA fight that I did um, up in Middlesbrough Town Hall. You know? Watching that for about 40 seconds, wasn't it? Something like that. I mean, mate, that was the, the most terrifying thing I'd ever done in my life. You know, <laughs> judo, you talk about judo, is you know, steeped in respect. And to that point, you know, you are trying to, you're not trying to hurt someone, but you're trying to beat someone, you know, and that's choking them out, arm lock, flat on their back, you know, and you're never trying to hurt someone, but the chances are it will happen. It's a physical sport. Physical, right? Yeah, but there's that respect, right? You, you finish, you bow, shake hands, hug it out. You know, you were then off to the hotel bar that you were staying in and you'd see that guy and, you you know, great fight, whatever. I think, you know, frustrations from me not getting to the games leads me to sign up to an MMA fight. You know, the guy, I remember he had a promotion. It was in like five weeks or three months. And I was just like five weeks, sign me up. I think you and I actually had a sparring session in the dojo at, um, uh, at the third space. And at the first... The most terrifying moment is fighting in the MMA arena that I fought in Middlesbrough. But the second most terrifying thing is you standing above me with 
MMA gloves on attacking me. I just remember this man mounted over me. I was like, oh my God, this is terrifying. But um, yeah, I mean, listen, had I gone to the Olympics, I probably wouldn't have done the MMA fight. So I think that's how I kind of, you know, I was in a funny headspace when I left. I did and and you might not have had the opportunity you did, right? And so I pleased. I, yeah. And by the way, I'm pleased I did it. You know, I love a challenge. I did that MMA fight. I won, you know, and actually the guy that I beat, he was, remember his name, Stuart Tyree, terrifying guy, shaved head. You yep. know, he came out, everyone holding shoulders. He was like the king of the gym. I remember the night before I'd looked on YouTube and I said, I'd never look and I looked on YouTube. It just demolished his five opponents previous from head kicks to elbows. He choked one person out and I was like, oh my God. But you know, I, the previous week I'd done a, um, a European tournament for jiu-jitsu, which I've won. I won my division and the absolute, which is absolute is any weight category possible. Yep. But you know, that's something I've done all my life. And I look back on it, it's a big thing, but at the time you're so engulfed in it and you're just kind of like, that's just what I do day to day. I don't rate it, yeah, you know, yeah. I just don't, I'm just good at it and just get on with it. But you know, we spoke after the fight and he said, you know, I was terrified. Someone told me about your jiu-jitsu from the week before. Um, he was just like, I was just trying to stand on my feet and I just didn't want to fight. And I was like, mate, that's so funny because all I wanted to do was get you to the floor. <laughs> I saw you and I didn't want to get into it with you. And then he's gone on to, I think he's like a brown belt in jiu-jitsu now. And he's done a number of tournaments and we've stayed in touch. And yeah, so I mean, but yeah, I mean, I look back, you know, that was a situation that I probably wouldn't have done had I've gone. I think it was kind of done out of frustration initially. And then, you know, like most things you've got to make the most of the situation and the story I just told you, yeah. you make friends and whatever, but no, I look back at it. I don't, don't have any regrets, you know, sure. I would have loved to have, you know, been to Beijing and got a medal around my neck, you know, but life's pretty good. You know, got some great friends, great family. It's actually something I've never asked you. And, I, and I've always thought, how do I ask him? And I never thought I'll I'll get him on a podcast and then ask him on a podcast. But I've never <laughs> asked him what your, your thoughts were after that after that point because obviously at that stage you kind of went off in a different direction and we yeah. we we kind of well we, yeah we did lose touch I guess for a while and and you were off doing various other bits and pieces and 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 I never really got opportunity to ask you how you felt about it and I guess I guess then probably wasn't the time to ask you about it because there there's a I guess there was a a term of processing and figuring it all out and blah 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 so yeah i mean had you asked me back then it'd probably be a very different different yeah. answer you know not very different probably would have been a different answer but you know where i'm at right now with you know what i've accumulated in terms of relationships and words accomplished accomplished yeah you, yeah. you you actually stopped there, and I think you said accumulated because again, you you're one of these people I think that that has real problems acknowledging their successes in life. Yeah, well, I I will do, a vir- I will do. I'll do a virtual pat on the back here and and say, yeah. say you've done very well. Yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Spitting it all out. All right. Hey, yeah. I've known I've known you long enough to know that you you're not very good at taking compliments. So so you've done you know you've done very well, and obviously back you've then. Done very well to get me on this podcast, mate. <laughs> yeah, no, I figured that. I was like, has Bobby ever done any podcasts before? And uh, and what yeah, have you? Willing to talk about? IG, I did one IGTV with yeah, with the, other, the other day that he wrote me in. Um, but you know, I think that's also part of where I'm at now, and content with what I'm achieved, and actually where I'm at with insanity and the guys that I represent and look after and well, looking back on everything. Yeah. I mean, it's life's good. Life's really cool. Good. And you're working with some really good guys. I know, I know, I know of quite a few of them. Uh, I, I know a couple of them, I think, uh, but they all seem like really good, really good athletes, really good people. Is it just sport that you're looking at there? So we got IXB, which is the fitness division. Which is yeah, fitness and health. I came on board with my guys, and it's now a little bit more sort of performance as well. Um, my colleague Isaac and I were doing some great fun stuff over there. Um, but then Insanity obviously have their digital and their broadcast roster, which is huge. They've got some phenomenal names on there, which are, <clears throat> you know, you not have anything to do with fitness um, traditional. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's 
do you know what it is? I started, I just, I'm having such a good time right now with my guys. You know, there's CrossFit's funny. CrossFit's very similar to judo in terms of where the sport is. I mean, it's a little bit more evolved, but, you know, I remember CrossFit's hard, you know, so I've got Megan, Elliot, who are competing. Um, there's not a huge amount of money unless you're in the top 10, maybe top five. Yep. Um, you know, and there's no, there's no sidestepping, you know, it's like judo, there's no sidestep, you know, if you sidestep a session or decide to eat shit or don't want to do this, don't want to do that, you're going to get found out pretty quick on the map. You know, someone's going to bend you in half and it's the same with, same with CrossFit, um, you know, and, you know, judo has, you know, the Olympics happens every four years, but with every year you have a world or a European and then we have a huge, huge amount of tournaments to redeem ourselves and, you know, to get that pat on the back. But CrossFit, you know, CrossFit has a few tournaments and then you've got the CrossFit Games. That's, that's the biggest thing in the year. You know, it's everything leads up to that. Um, so I think when I decided to manage and I wanted to focus on sport and I started speaking to these guys, I just immediately resonated with what they were going through, who they were as individuals, what their mindsets were. I just recognised it immediately. Um, yeah, and that's... And at that point, were you doing... Because I know that you've taken on CrossFit, you've been doing a lot of it. At, at, at that point, were you already doing CrossFit or did you just start that up after you'd started dealing with these athletes? No, I started before. I started it. I mean, listen, it wouldn't, wasn't called CrossFit at the time, but, you know, you'll appreciate this, that a lot of the, a lot of the old school style of training that was just, you know, 70s or 80s, you yeah. know, whether it was like a lot of the Olympic stuff, you know, that was around for years. Um, it wasn't widely recognised in gyms. I mean, it just... <laughs> It's so hard, <laughs> but um, I, I was doing it for judo training, you know. Yeah, so yeah. that was I was into a lot of powerlifting and Olympic lifting. No good at it, I should say. Like there will be some people looking at me, looking at this podcast after can. What's he talking about? He's shit in the gym. He can only snatch forty kilos above his head, you know. But for wings for me, you know, is my mobility. You know, you've, shot, you've spent your entire life you know, eager. Yeah, uh, I think, honestly, yeah, twenty years yeah, of doing yeah, this. that becomes very, very difficult. I've seen your shoulder mobility, and now uh, I'm trying to do this. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, that for me is a big win. Um, but you enjoy. So, but you enjoy it clearly. And, you know, I, I see you doing it pretty much every day, some form or, you know, something based around work capacity, right? You're always, yeah. you know, off and on assault bikes, doing lots of, yeah. you know, uh, repetitions and rounds of things and, and what have you. So, so is that something that you've got into? Are you going to compete in CrossFit? No, no. Huh? You might, not even in the Masters. They're absolute machines. Just enjoying it. And I really, really enjoy it. You know, it keeps you accountable. Um, and... You know, I mean, listen, I used to train three, three times a day, yeah, yeah. five times a week, you know, and twice on a Saturday, active recovery on a Sunday, you know, but I used to love it. It wasn't a chore. You know, I used to absolutely love physical movement. And how does that look now for you? So, so what does a day in Bobby, Bobby's world look like? Are you, you know, what kind of things are you embrace with respect to movement, with respect to, you know, general health, diet, nutrition, all those things? Consistency, really, yeah. you know, is the biggest biggest key. You know, I'm training every day. You know, might be tends to be a 45 minute to an hour session. You know, and this is in the gym, yeah. In the gym. Yep. You know whether that's well, you know, not right now. It's your living room, right? But it's you know, go back. It'd be in the gym. But it's yeah, just keep moving. You know, I mean, I, I have no interest in doing three sessions a day or even two, two sessions a day, you know, and that's not because, you know, I don't like it. I love moving and I love fitness and it's just part of who I am. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not something I really think about doing. It's, it's, it's just been part of the journey and who I am now. Um, but, you know, I, 45 minutes or an hour every day, five days a week is, perfect for me it's what i enjoy um need to do more mobility <laughs> more flexibility um and out of lockdown you'll be doing probably some yeah i know jujitsu plays quite a well bjj plays a, a quite a large role with what you do as well doesn't it 
Yeah, huge part. I mean, when we go, yeah, cool. when we see, I'm not even counting that, but uh, it's been so now long. We're twice a day. <laughs> now we're up to twice a day exercising, no? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'll, I'll be on the mat sort of when things open back up, sort of two, three times a week. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, jujitsu. I mean, the gym, gym wise, that will always happen, but and I absolutely love it. But you know, if someone says, "Do you want to go to the gym or do you want to go and fight?" you know, or get on the mat and it doesn't even have to be fighting. It's just technical, yeah, yeah. technical work. I'll take that all day long. You know, that's my bread and butter and that's what I love. But equally for the physical, you know, I talk about the physical and, and keeping fit. It's for the mental side of stuff, you know, yep. moving and, you know, it's humbling as well. You know, it's good for you. You know, it's good every now and then just to go to the gym and take a bit of a kick in, puts you in your place, gives you a bit of a reset. Um, but yeah, jujitsu is a huge part of my life now. You know, I during judo, you know, my I was stand up, like I was talking earlier, like my wrestling yeah, yeah. was yeah. is how I how I used to find and I did a lot of it standing on my feet and my groundwork wasn't particularly great. You know, I'd I'd launch someone through the air, get them on there, get them to the ground, and I'd be like <laughs> what do we do now <laughs> what do i do now you know um and but fortunately so those jujitsu guys that used to come upstairs and was that uh, traditional jujitsu they were doing downstairs brazilian jujitsu oh yeah. right it's traditional jujitsu has a lot of kind of throwing in it right yeah so that's it's got a lot of throwing in it and then it's evolved into brazilian jujitsu which is more of the competitive side yeah um but those guys that used to come upstairs with guy you know his coach was roger gracie roger gracie yeah. 10 times, I mean, I, I don't say a number, I'd probably get it wrong. Plus, 10, 10 plus times world champion. Rog, Roger's never been beaten, right? Roger's never been beaten. He's uh, he's just a freak, an absolute freak. <laughs> you know, he's, what, what is he, 6'4", six, 6'5"? Six, yeah. You know, arms equally as long, gets hold of you. It's like a bow constrictor. I mean, you know, but so I had the benefit of him coming upstairs and ultimately coaching me on my groundwork. You know, this is like midway through my career, 2004, 2005, you know, where if I wanted to get to the games, I really needed to focus on, you know, making my whole game in judo, uh, you know, making it complete. Um, so I started doing jujitsu. jitsu um, And I probably do that more now. I go to judo a couple of times a month, but jujitsu jitsu regularly, yep. you know, one, because it's... <laughs> judo hurts <laughs> you know judo really hurts um you know it's, it's a lot more explosive there's a lot of gripping you know finger snapping impact you know judo's it, it, it yeah i can't it just hurts now you know i'm 40 now yeah. you know and it takes a day or two i still turn up to the judo mat you know i'm fit and strong like you say i'm doing my crossfit and keep relatively fit and i'm in good condition so i go there and i still think i'm excuse my language but i still think i'm the bollocks right so but i'm not you know my timing's a little bit out and i still don't fall do my up. best and then i i then wake up the next morning like <laughs> trying to open up and i'm like opening my hands and you know so jujitsu is hard but it's less impact and it's you know it's more of a cardiovascular more of a sweat um more of a chess game um so i do that more but yeah, I absolutely love it. I got my black belt from Roger five years ago. Um, but to your point earlier about sort of black belts and grading systems, like jujitsu is really interesting because it, it considers a lot of the stuff that you've asked. It considers a lot of that in the process and the journey from getting your white belt through to your black belt. You know, it's there's never one moment where you can go and do a grading because you're 16, you can earn it. It generally takes, I think on average, it's about 10 years that someone can get their black belt. Yeah. You know, so you go to a club and, um, you know, I had a bit of a head start because, you know, because my judo background, I say I was bad. I wasn't like terrible. You know, I wasn't like, I was still a GB athlete and I was still doing, doing well. But for the, the comparison from my standing work and groundwork was like abysmal. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, Roger was like, all right, come down to my club. He was going down to his club in Kensal and, um, I think he jumped me up from a white belt. There's two two belts in between, but he jumped me up from a white belt to purple, you know, because he was like, I've got a few of my brown belts that are getting pissed off that a white belt is is beating them. Because I'd turn up, I'd take my black belt off from the judo. Yeah, yeah. 
this one here, I would take that off and I would um, put a white belt on just out of respect for the sport. You know, it's a, it's, there's similarities, but it's a different sport and for the respect to the mat. Um, but yeah, so Roger, he, he, he gave me my purple belt pretty soon, but then I stayed there for maybe three or four years, went to Brown, maybe three years later, got my black. Um, but yeah, they take in a huge amount of thought as to why someone should get their belt. It's done on application, yeah. their attitude, consistency, um, personality, a number of things. And it's something that makes someone, you know, a complete athlete, but also attributes that would make someone, I wouldn't say complete, but a better human as well, you know, so. Which is really interesting. That's that's something yeah. that I'm hoping Roger will, will come and have a little conversation on here at some point as well. And oh, you, I mean, you have to. I mean, you talk about me not wanting to talk about like accomplishments. I mean, his accomplishments in his sport are, are just mind blowing and just blow me out of the water. But you know, he. I mean, you, you know, what he's like. Yeah. I mean, he's the greatest jujitsu player of all time, but he, he will never say it. He will never. I mean, he's so quietly spoken. I mean, if you're on a Zoom, you have no idea how huge he is. <laughs> you know, he's just kind of, you know, but God, you know, he gave me my black belt. He gave me a black belt. And then I went back to the dojo the next week for a training session. We've done our technical stuff. Roger's like, hey, my friend, monster, come here. We train together. I'm like, great, I'm cool. I've got my black belt. We're going to do something. Not damage, but like, got my black belt. He basically... You know, in that five minute round of sparring, he he basically took my black belt off me and gave me a white belt back. <laughs> it was just like, you know, it was like, dude, you know, you just gave me this and you just arm bars and chokes and but that's levels, right? It's when you start to appreciate levels, right? And you you understand that, that you know there's a massive void between you know somebody who's where you are and somebody where is where he yeah. is. And, yeah. And even in a sport like that, the, 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 there's a massive void there, isn't there, between the skills and the acquisition. And, and I mean, Rogers, Rogers probably done this since he was in in nappies, right? We've been doing it since he was rolling around. But I mean, to your point earlier, and like you know how you deal with situations or individuals, whether they're in our own environment or in an environment that I stepped in that I had nothing knew nothing about into the world of you know celebrities, whether I was training them or working personally with them. You know, it's it's like you say, it's levels, right? And just because I'm good at judo, what, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything. You know, it teaches you, you know, the amount of respect I just had for Roger for taking my black belt off me and basically giving me a white belt instead of getting frustrated. I was. Oh, yeah, you did that. No, he didn't do that. I've still got my black. <laughs> no, no, metaphorically, yeah. that's how I felt. Yeah, no, no, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I took it as a metaphor. The first oh, I, black belt. I, was like, I was like, you said it a second time. Maybe he actually did this. No, no, no. It wasn't quite, wasn't quite as bad as that. It's how I felt. But um, I forgot what I was going to say. He was, um, yeah, it just, it, it humbles you, right? It, yeah. you know, it puts you, it doesn't say put you in your place. I mean, I came off that session thanking him for doing what he did to me. You know, it was just mind blowing. It was just incredible, you know? So, yeah. But, but that then goes right back to something that we talk about a lot. And I've talked to multiples of guests about it, right? Is that mindset of you've just been absolutely schooled by somebody and you can take that one or two ways, right? You can either go, oh my God, I'm so far off the mark here. Yeah. But then there's the appreciation that this is a guy who's never been beaten by anybody in this on the planet, right? At that particular, and it was an absolute pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you, you know, and, and you, you're humble by it, but then you, you think, right, I've got a lot to learn, and I'm going to go out there, I'm going to learn it to the best of my ability, and I might never reach the, you know, the mantle of where he is, but but it, it still drives me forward, right? And I think it's, yeah, it's that journey, it's that journey. Yeah, you know, you and, and that ability to accept defeat, right? Yeah, yeah, and learn something from yeah. it, move on from it, and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So. And by the way, I, I had to learn that, you know, I wasn't always like that, you know, as a kid and most kids, you know, they want to be good at anything they do. I'm, I, you know, I'm sure my mum will tell me that I had a number of tantrums, you know, if I got beat or lost and stuff like that. But, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's something I had to learn for sure. I wasn't always so gracious in losing. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right, so, we, so we've, before, and I'm conscious of how long we've been we've been chatting away, and I, I'm, there's multiples of avenues we can go down. But recently, in the press, obviously, they, it's been all about you know you're you're responsible for keeping David Beckham in shape. So, so it would be very rude of me, I think, to to end this podcast without asking the question: What exactly do you do with him? I heard, I read some stuff about handstands. So, so what are you actually doing with him? What are you putting him through here? I'm so, really hoping you got to tell me it's something crazily intense and nasty and horrible. No, not really. I mean, listen, it's, again, it's consistency. You know, I'm, we, you know, when we were allowed, you know, I was training David. Um, and Dave, I mean, listen, he's, a, he's an elite athlete. You know, he, he will always be a, an elite athlete, whether he's retired or not. He has that, you know, the sessions will be different. You know, they won't be intense, but the mindset is there, right? So, you know, I mean, listen, I... I tell that guy to do something he's never done. I tell him to do a handstand, right? Never, you know, he's done headstands, he's done yoga and stuff like that before, but he tries it once, you know, bit uncertain. Then I say, just reposition your hand here, do that. And the second time he does it, he nails it and he's up, you know, it's that kind of attention to detail that he has and the muscle memory um, and the focus he has. Um, but no, it's not crazy, crazy stuff. You know, things like handstands, we all know it's good for shoulder strengthening, core stability. But listen, it's also about, it's a bit of fun, right? You know, it's doing things that you've never done, doing things that you didn't think you can, can do. Um, and once you achieve those things and you make it fun, you know, that's the biggest thing, right? It's uh, yeah, yeah. prescribing exercise that people want to do. You know, but yeah, I mean, I trained David, you know, we were before lockdown and then virtually we were training when we had to, and then it opened up for a minute, but you know, we get back to it when things are normal, but um, yeah, nothing too crazy, but you know, he's got a training program and he's sticks to it. I mean, you know, he's. And is his general goal just to keep in shape? Keep in shape. Keep in shape. No, nothing outside. Yeah. I just, just wants to keep himself ticking away and doing his thing and blah, blah, blah. He just wants to be in good shape, you know, but I do think it's as much as that as it is just something that, like I was saying earlier, that I, it's just something that's inbred. I couldn't imagine waking up and not training. And I don't mean that in a obsessive way, you know, I'm quite happy to have a Sunday off in bed, have a coffee and a couple of croissants, you know, but I just mean it in a sense of, you know, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy it. And it was a huge part of my life. And I think he's exactly the same. And I think, and I think, if anybody that knows anything about his kind of career, I think he 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 always reminds me a lot of uh, the ilk of kind of Johnny Wilkinson and blah blah blah. Is that, yeah, you know, he, he, in his early sort of career, he was he was the sort of person that would go out and just repeat something and repeat something and keep doing it, keep doing it, and keep doing it until he nailed it, right? Which is very much like judo, right? Judo, there's a lot of technicality there, a lot of skills which you just have to repeat. And I remember watching you on the mat at at Budokai, and and it was just this 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 almost like playing I remember we had a table tennis table at school where he, because there were so many people wanting to play you just used to walk around the table and you used to take a shot and it used to rotate and it was like that and there was you and and I think about another 20 guys and it was literally just you just walked on got thrown and then walked off again and it, it was, yeah, it was, yeah. <clears throat> this repetition and I think anybody who remembers David sort of early in his career it was this thing about repetition and, and again you know the ilk of Johnny Wilkinson right and People always used to be, you know, he's out there practicing his kicking and just doing it again and again and again and again. He was renowned, wasn't he? Renowned for <clears throat> the stories that used to come out that whether he won or lost the game, yeah, he, the crowd yeah. would go, yeah. the team would go, yeah. the support staff, and he would be on there aiming for a single chair behind yeah. the the goal. I mean, Re myself. revisiting it again and again and again. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember reading some stuff about David, who, you know, and, and 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 just taking the same shot again and again and again and again and again until he nailed it right which I think is something that, that carries over into so many things about this, you know, this repetition and this, the, these things that we do in life, right? The, the, the things that we repeatedly do ultimately end up in the outcome that we get, right? And obviously this is, this is something where you've had stuff that carried over from judo, you've taken into your, your life, your business, all the other things that you do. And obviously that attention to detail that you, you have for 
other people in many respects. I mean, you, you know, you don't get a gig looking after somebody or, or, or looking after their, uh, their presence or however you want to kind of classify it. But what you did with Jason, what you did with, uh, with Guy, what you've done with David and Brooklyn and blah, 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 is there's a lot of attention to detail involved, right? There's a lot, you've got to think ahead and you've got to plan and you've got to know what's happening at what time, which is, which is something I think is a trait that a lot of people are trying to develop all the time. And obviously with the mindset that overlays it, that they're trying to develop all of that. And, and I think you're a, you're, you're, you're a great example of somebody who's carried that over. I, I, I still think you need to work on your, uh, you know, your, your ability to accept compliments and, and, <laughs> and, and, and acknowledge your accomplishments in life. But I think it's, you know, I think also that's a very humbling trait. I think in a lot of people where, where you see them and they just chip away and get on with stuff and, and blah, blah, blah. something that's important, right? I mean, you're talking about this repetition, whether it's on a football pitch, judo mat, or if it's in life, you know, it's something that's hugely important to remember, you know, because we live in a, a life right now, which is a hugely digital life, you know, and it's whatever, it, it, you know, there's so many shortcuts out there to get to where you need to go. So it's really important to remember that repetition, remember the journey, you know, instead of just trying to get to that end end goal without any experience, any of that duration of whatever that journey takes. Um, so it's a really important thing that people need to remember. And I think learning that from such an early age, I mean, it's, you know, you can imagine as a six-year-old, you just go in and it is just repetitive. I remember doing karate. I think it was eight years old I started doing karate and it was, you know, it was just literally you just went in and you just repeated these sequences of movements again and again and again and again. And that's that's what it was because you, you kind of quite enjoyed it uh, as well. And it was, you know, it's like in jujitsu and, and you know, I took, took up jujitsu very late in life and unfortunately I haven't been able to do it on a consistent basis again because of logistics. You know, I don't have a club anywhere near me. And it's, you know, it's the sort of thing where you kind of go in and you want to learn this skill and then you want to learn this other skill really quickly and this other skill before you've mastered the first one. Yeah. And obviously as a kid, I think you, you know, you get those basic skills drilled into you so much that you get that appreciation of as you get older, you, you get the more advanced skills, but you're like, no, 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 I want to stick with this, get this right before I move on to the next, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean. I mean, that's, that's kind of, I had no choice back then. I mean, we live in a very different, <clears throat> excuse me, we live in a very different generation now, you know, where, we have, we have access to so many things and see so many things to be good at, you know, didn't have that back then. But I can tell you what, I went to, you know, Japan. I remember going to Japan for the first time when I was 20, I think. I went there when I was 20, 21 for six weeks on my own. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I thought my, my approach to judo and that repetition was second to none. You know, roll through the week of, number of sparring sessions randori we call them then you get to saturday and saturday was just technical session it was a three-hour session and there would be 150 odd players on the mat and this is tokai university so the universities in japan are the equivalent of a um a college in um is a college in the u.s that have you know high level players that will then go on to play in the nfl like many, many of the players many of the judo players in Tokai University, they're world champions, Olympic champions, you know. So we get to these Saturday, we do a technical session, 150 people on the mat. They split them 50, 50, 50 people on the mat in three different areas. And group A is going to work on one technique, group B, one technique, group C, one technique, one hour each. Once that hour's done, this group moves to that, that group moves to that, that group moves to that. You do three hours and it's literally coming bang, whatever it might be, throw one hour, you know, and you work out with your partner. You either go, right, you do five minutes, I do five minutes, or you do 200 turn-ins, I'll do 200 turn-ins. Wow. And I remember the first time I did that, and I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Slept well. Slept well. Went home and cried. My elbows were killing me. But, you know, again, it was another stepping stone to realise, you know, build that. The RSI is a real thing. RSI is a very real <laughs> thing. You know, our physio Kevin had fun with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Hey, look, what a fascinating story uh, that, that continues. Uh, we're far from done yet, I'm sure, Bobby. 
and uh, I'm sure there's, there's plenty more tales to tell. So, so I'll be pulling you back on here in the future. And uh, you can an absolute me. pleasure. I've just turned forty, so I hope I've got a few more years and tales to tell. But sure, you, I'm sure you'll do all right. I, I, I won't be bringing up my age right at this moment, but, <laughs> and and you won't be catching me up, unfortunately. So, <laughs> been an absolute pleasure, Bobby. You're a you're a gentleman. Uh, known you for many years, and and you know a huge amount of respect for what you do, what you've done, and and what you continue to do. So so thank you for taking the time to to join us on the podcast, and uh, keep doing your thing. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Cool, and we'll speak soon. All right. Cheers, mate. Take, Take care. Bye bye.